Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we will be taking VTOG train number 94 from Stockholm in Sweden, all the way above the Arctic Circle to Narvik in Norway. This is one of the world's most intriguing sleeper train routes, servicing the world's northernmost standard gauge railway station. The trip starts at Stockholm Central Station, which has excellent transit connectivity to locations throughout the city. The train departs at 6.10 p.m. in the evening, hugging the eastern coast of the Baltic Sea as it heads towards northern Sweden. It then turns westward to cross the Swedish Lapland and the mountains in Norway's Ofoten region to reach the Arctic port city of Narvik. The section of railway approaching Narvik is exceptionally scenic, featuring beautiful views of mountains and fjords. Narvik is a historic town in northern Norway. Far above the Arctic Circle, the sun does not set here during the height of summer. The journey takes 18 and a half hours, arriving at 12.35 p.m. the following day. This is the perfect length for a one-night sleeper train trip. So let's hop aboard for the trip of a lifetime. Immediately after boarding, the train departs right on time. Swedish trains operate with precision. We are riding in a second-class private compartment, which can fit up to three people. However, it is more comfortable with two or less. Six-person couchette compartments, as well as both open saloon and compartment coach seating, is also available. This train also has first-class two-person sleeper compartments, but they do not run all the way to Narvik. The first-class cars instead split from the train at Boden and continue eastward to Luleå. As we rocket northward from Stockholm, let's take a close look at the various accommodations on the train. This is a six-person couchette compartment. The middle beds fold down from the wall. These are type BC4 cars from the mid-1980s. The second-class sleeper compartment has an exquisite design. While it can fit three people, we will mention again that it is comfortable with two or less. The second-class sleeper cars are type WL6 and were built in the early 1990s. Most importantly, unlike the couchette cars, these compartment cars are equipped with air conditioning. Even in Northern Europe, it can get quite hot on the train, especially in June and July when the sun shines for close to 24 hours a day. The bedding is comfortable and the sink makes it easy to freshen up. Electrical outlets are also provided, along with drinking water. The first-class sleeper compartment is quite nice. It fits two people very comfortably. These cars are type WL4, built in the early 1990s. This restroom, although somewhat rudimentary, is very clean. The first and second-class sleeper compartments are secured with punched hole key cards, similar to a hotel. The second-class sleeper cars also have a shower room, which is kept relatively clean. It is kept well stocked with towels and is quite nice, as sleeper car showers go. This coach car is type B9, built in the 1980s and converted to its current configuration in the 1990s. Interestingly, both standard open saloon seating as well as conversational style compartment seating is provided. The compartment seating area was originally intended for passengers who wished to smoke. Here is one more view at the interior of these very interesting cars. The train also has Type B2 coach cars, built in the same time period. They omit the compartment seating area. We have paused at our first stop, 
Yavle. This station is 182 kilometers north of Stockholm, approximately one hour and 51 minutes into the trip. While we wait, an X-51 type regional train pulls in. The destination signs indicate that our train, number 94, is going to both Luleo and Narvik. Tomorrow morning, when the train arrives in Boden, the rear cars will be uncoupled and run to Luleo, while the front cars will go to Narvik. It is now time for dinner, so let's head over to the restaurant car. The restaurant car is very unique. Designated type R12, these cars were built in the late 1960s and were narrowly saved from being scrapped. Five were taken off of the scrap line in 2012 to be fully refurbished for northern services in Sweden. Food selections are retrieved by passengers, who bring them to the car attendant to be quickly heated in a convection oven. The options are excellent and there is a lot of variety. While it is not fancy, it is an exceptionally efficient and pleasant experience. Tonight, we will try the highly recommended Northern Forest Stew. Don't let its appearance fool you. The Northern Forest Stew is excellent and full of flavor without being too heavy. Despite being reheated in a convection oven, it is much better than it has any right to be, and certainly beats most airline meals. Of course, it also puts Amtrak's horrible, flexible dining food to shame, which is prepared in convection ovens in the same way. Meanwhile, the train leaves Hudiksvall Station. What a nice sunset view to have during dinner. At the end of the train, passengers are able to look out of the rear window. The view is incredible. Because of how far north we are, sunset is extremely late. This clip was recorded at 10 p.m. in the evening. The sun will never fully set. The sky will just darken to twilight for a few hours before sunrise the next morning. This will be the last sunset that we will see. By tomorrow, we will cross the Arctic Circle and be able to see the midnight sun. For now, let's just take in the view. Around 1 o'clock in the morning, we make a brief stop at Ornholtsvik station. Notice that it is not fully dark, even after midnight. It is now time to go to sleep. Thankfully, the sleeper cars have blackout curtains to keep the light from entering the cabin. The train runs very fast, but despite this, the plush bedding and smooth tracks ensure a restful night's sleep. The next day, we wake up around 5.30 a.m., with sunlight streaming into the cabin already. We are about 40 minutes from Bowdoin, where the train will be cut and recombined with services to and from Luleo. In no time at all, we have arrived in Bowdoin. The rear cars on our train will be uncoupled to run to Luleo. Similarly, the cars on the train that arrive from Luleo will be coupled to the rear of our train and will continue onward with us to Narvik. On the left are the two cars that arrived on the train from Luleo one type B9 coach and a type BFS9 coach baggage snack car. On the right is our train from Stockholm. The R12 restaurant car, as well as the coaches behind it, will be uncoupled to run to Luleo. The cars in the front of the train will be swung over to the other track to couple to the cars that arrived from Luleo. The iconic Swedish RC6 locomotive couples up to the through cars to Narvik. This is a classic European style buffer and chain coupling. A worker will have to manually connect the locomotive to the cars.
the cars are pulled out to be swung over to the other track to couple to the cars from Luleo. Given how early it is, there are few passengers on the platform stretching their legs, despite the long scheduled dwell time. With the through cars from Narvik moved away, we get a better view of Bowdoin Central Station. Here we see the through cars being coupled to the cars from Luleo. This is a relatively delicate procedure, performed by highly trained employees. Before leaving, we take one last look at the rare Type R12 restaurant car. After hopping back on the train, soon enough we leave Bowdoin and continue north. The newly added BFS 9 coach has an interesting layout. On the left is a compartment seating area. This is followed by an office for the train crew a snack bar, and saloon-style coach seating. Here is an additional look at the interior of the car. Quite a unique layout. The landscape has changed significantly. We are now passing through the lakes and boreal forest of the Swedish Lapland. Our next stop is Moriek, approximately 50 minutes later. Even small stations like this are maintained very well. For a remote area, rail service in this location is very robust, especially compared to inner-city train frequencies often found in the United States. As we leave Moriek, we get a glimpse of one of the leading industries in this area of Sweden, logging. All of these logs have been piled up to be picked up by freight trains. It is at this exact moment that we cross the Arctic Circle. There are very few locations where you can do this on a train. For context, we are already significantly further north than Fairbanks, Alaska. Soon after, we arrive in Jalivare, one of the most significant settlements in this area of the Swedish Lapland. Jalivare is also the terminus of the Inlandsbanan, a lesser-used north-south rail line that runs through the inland areas of Sweden. Ridership at this station is relatively high. We then proceed further towards the mining city of Kiruna. As we approach Kiruna, large mounds of ore are visible. This is the largest and most modern iron ore mine in the world. The Kiruna mine is a major economic driver for the region. Much of the railway infrastructure here was built for the ore trains. The mining here has been so intensive that the entire city is being moved to avoid subsidence caused by the mine underneath. Kiruna is operated as a stub end station. The locomotive will uncouple and run to the other end of the train to continue pulling us north. 
This allows passengers a few minutes to stretch their legs. At the end of the platform, we see a few rail cars used to transport iron ore. After leaving Kiruna, the landscape becomes more mountainous as we approach the border between Sweden and Norway. The train begins to skirt its way around the foothills as it continues to climb. We are now arriving in Obisko, which is a popular destination for nature tourists. This station is Obisko Estra, located on the east side of town. There is also an Obisko tourist station, which serves nearby hiking trails. The train is running over the Malmbanan, which is Swedish for Iron Ore Railway. Many portions of this line are single track. Trains occasionally have to hold to allow trains running in the other direction to vacate single track areas. A few minutes later, we pull into Abisko Tourist Station. Nearby is the Aurora Sky Station, a chalet perched at the top of Nuolia Mountain. The Aurora Sky Station is accessible by a very interesting old chairlift built by a Swiss company, Brandle. This chairlift has very rare old-style portal towers and is walking distance from the Obisco Tourist Station. This is a must visit. The line continues to get steeper and curvier as we climb towards the next station, Bjork Liden. Perplexingly, almost no other passengers availed themselves of the view from the rear of the train here. Bjork Liden is one of the several towns along this line that have associated ski areas, which have great terrain. In the summertime, the same towns have many hiking trails for visitors to explore. The line passes through many snow sheds in this area. These protect the railway against avalanches and snow drifts during the winter time. The Malmbanan was built in 1888 to transport iron ore from the mine at Kiruna to the deep water port at Narvik. This line has been continuously upgraded to handle heavier trains, increase throughput, and provide higher reliability. Many snow sheds and passing sidings have been built since 1888 to improve the efficiency of the line. In this area of the railway, many passengers stay by the open side windows, taking in the views. The crew has no issue with this. That said, please remember to rail fans safely with common sense. These clips were all taken without placing extremities outside of the vehicle. We are coming to a stop at Vasiyara. This train is normally not scheduled to stop here. However, besides the sleeper train, there is also a daytime local train that runs between Narvik and Luleo, which services the station. Beyond the station is a single track area. We are waiting for that eastbound local train to Luleo to pass by. Many of these smaller stations, which are only served by the local train service, are in very sparsely populated areas. Regardless, all of these stations receive significant upkeep and maintenance work. With the local train passing us, we proceed into the single track area. Notice how much shorter these coach-only services are. The scheduling of these local trains make it possible to take day trips from Narvik to the various local towns along the Malmbanan. 
Our train then enters another one of the many snowsheds up here in the mountains. The snowsheds are countless. Up next is a very brief stop in Katarczak. Katarczak is just a short concrete slab platform, surrounded by picturesque views on all sides. On the right is a classic Poma platter lift, which transports skiers up a slope adjacent to the railway. We are now arriving at the last station in Sweden, Riksgransen. This is another town that was founded to serve the railway line. It has since grown into a significant tourism destination. Riksgransen is also a popular location for the winter testing of pre-production automobiles by various European manufacturers. Interestingly, half of the station platform is located inside of a snowshed. Because why wouldn't it? Riksgransen is one of the few stations on the line that still has a wooden platform, albeit only at the extreme ends of the station. The border between Sweden and Norway is just beyond the station, located in the snowshed. Because Sweden and Norway are both in the European Schengen area, there is no border control to deal with. With its snowshed, Riksgränsen is certainly one of the most unique railway stations in the world. The border between Sweden and Norway is marked in the snowshed very clearly, and can be easily seen if you know when to look. We slowed the video down to 25% to make it easier to spot. At regular speed, it passes quite quickly. The Norwegian side of the line to Narvik is termed the Ofotbanen. It is maintained by Ban Nur, the Norwegian government agency responsible for the upkeep of the country's railways. Despite the change in management, the railway infrastructure appears largely the same. While this line hosts a considerable amount of passenger traffic, most of the trains are LKAB's freight trains moving iron ore from Kiruna. As we exit the single track area west of Riksgränsen, we see one of these ore trains waiting to proceed in the other direction. These trains are hauled by the Adtrans Bombardier Eeyore engines, which are among the most powerful locomotives in the world. Around 15 of these impressive iron ore trains run every single day. They are easy to catch by waiting at a midline station. We recommend exploring the stations along the line, which afford great views of these trains. This view is at a Bisco tourist station. Two to three days are necessary at a minimum to satisfactorily explore this incredible railway. These ore trains are around 68 cars long. This is relatively short when compared to freight trains in Australia and the United States. However, the extreme weight of the iron ore, along with the steep grades of this line, make these trains quite impressive. Besides the Eeyore hauled LKAB trains, two trains per day are also run by Connus Iron, pulled by Bombardier Trax locomotives. These provide a nice change from the monotony of the interesting but very common LKAB iron ore trains. The rich natural resources in the region and the utility of Narvik's port have given rise to considerable industrial competition.
Besides the ore trains, mixed cargo trains are also run on the line. This train is run by DB Schenker, but others are run by CargoNet. Just across the border, we pass the station of Bjornfjell. Bjornfjell is the eastern terminus of the Arctic Train Service, which provides additional local passenger service out of Narvik. The route of the rail line has been modified several times. In 1988, the railway was realigned significantly near Susterbeck. This is where the original right-of-way branched off. Susterbeck station has been moved to the new alignment. We then pass the Nordalsbruak, Norwegian for Nordal Bridge. The line was realigned to eliminate the need for this bridge. The bridge was then closed to rail traffic, but it has been preserved as a historic monument. We are now about 20 minutes from Narvik. As we begin to approach our final destination, the scenery becomes even more dramatic when the Rombakan Fjord comes into view. The railway line has to make several sweeping curves in this area to account for the landscape around the fjord. As mentioned before, the railway staff allows passengers to look out of the open side windows, bearing in mind that they must be careful. Remember, always rail fan in a manner that is safe and legal, and please comply with the instructions of railway personnel. As we pass Rombach Station, we see the Arctic train heading in the opposite direction. These are type BM69D EMU cars. They are a 1970s design, but this subtype was built between 1983 and 1993. Most BM69s have been retired, however a few sets have been refurbished for use by private operators like the Arctic Train. Visible down below is the Rombach Bridge. For a long time, this bridge was the only way to quickly proceed further north from Narvik. Opened in 1964, it allows vehicular traffic to cut across the Rumbakan Fjord instead of having the drive out and around it. It has since been supplanted by the much longer Halugaland Bridge in Narvik proper. This tunnel, just outside of Narvik, was built in the early 2010s, bypassing a curvy section of track. The old track was also retained serving as a passing siding. This will be the last major tunnel that we will pass through before arriving in Narvik. We are now approaching Narvik with a sweeping set of curves at the mouth of the Rumbakan Fjord. The new Halogaland Bridge, opened in 2018, comes into view. It is at this exact point that we traverse the absolute northernmost portion of the railway. Notably, this is the northernmost portion of standard gauge track in the world still connected to the rest of the European rail network. We now proceed along a downward slope to the station at Narvik. Just a minute later, the train pulls right into the center of Narvik along a sweeping right-hand curve. We have now arrived at our final destination, Narvik Station. Narvik is fairly walkable, and many passengers simply walk from the station to their final destinations in the town. We have arrived right on time at 12.35 p.m. This train is scheduled to depart Narvik towards Stockholm just a few hours later at 3.11 p.m. To prepare for the southbound departure, 
the engine is shunted to the other end of the train. All six of the tracks at Narvik Station quickly combine into a single track just outside of the station. The locomotive then pulls back in to couple to the south end of the train. The train crew once again executes a masterfully smooth ad. With the locomotive moved to the other end, the car cards are changed to indicate the new destination. Narvik Station is well maintained and even features a preserved example of an early steam locomotive used on the Ofotbahn. The train crew then shunts the train into a siding just beyond Narvik Station to await its afternoon departure. This operation occurs daily. With less than three hours of schedule recovery time in Narvik, it requires high on-time performance. As usual, the Swedish and Norwegian railway authorities have done a great job keeping the trains running efficiently. Looking at the train sitting in the yard, we can't help but want to take another ride. This was an incredible trip. But for now, it's time to explore this incredible town far above the Arctic Circle. It feels like everywhere you look, there is an incredible view to be had. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to hit that subscribe button.